J.K. Rowling hates women. Yes, she hates trans women. We know this because she says so all the time. It's one of her favorite things to say. But she also hates all women. And the proof is in the pudding. And the pudding is the Harry Potter series. J.K. Rowling writes female characters like a man who hates women. Out of the top 100 Harry Potter characters by number of mentions, only 28 of those characters are women. Let's go through each of those characters one by one and explore the depths of J.K. Rowling's internalized misogyny. Before we get started, I want to say that I'm not making this video to make anybody feel guilty about liking Harry Potter now or in the past. The reason that I know all these things about Harry Potter is because I read each of those books at least seven times growing up. And I did notice the lack of female representation because I used to like to pretend that I was one of the characters in the books that I was reading and I remember noticing that there weren't that many female characters to choose from with Harry Potter. But of course I wasn't looking at Harry Potter through a super critical lens when I was a kid. I'm making this video because I love to analyze things and I love a list and I love to rant and this is fun for me. We're gonna start from the bottom and work our way up. Coming in at number 94 in J.K. Rowling's top 100 characters by number of mentions, our 28th female on the list is none other than pug-faced Pansy Parkinson. Pansy Parkinson is a Slytherin in Harry Potter's year. She is described as having blonde hair, blue eyes, and a pug face. I always took issue with her being described as pug faced because I had a pug growing up. I love pugs. I know that they are a genetic abomination and I love them. So I thought it was rude that pug faced was used as an insult because pugs are cute. But Pansy Parkinson has zero redeemable qualities. She is a mean girl. That is the extent of her character. She is basically the only girl that hangs out with the Slytherin squad at any point during the books. At one point, she dates Draco Malfoy, which ups her number of mentions, which is probably what put her in the top 100 characters. She probably wouldn't have made it in those top 100 had she not dated Draco Malfoy. She was in the Inquisitorial squad with Dolores Umbridge, which was just a group of narcs to tell on Harry and his friends. She is just a mean girl with no redeemable qualities and no redemption arc. Coming in at number 91 in the top 100 Harry Potter characters by number of mentions, and number 27 in the top 28 female Harry Potter characters by number of mentions, is the Fat Lady. The fat lady is the painting that guards the Gryffindor common room. In order to get into the Gryffindor common room, you have to tell the fat lady the password. It's not surprising that the fat lady is a fat phobic character because the name the fat lady is fat phobic in and of itself, though she does a perfect job of guarding the Gryffindor common room and only lets people in that have the password, she is portrayed as annoying and a nuisance and a burden and single and desperate and drunk and a glutton. She's getting drunk in the paintings. In the third book, Sirius Black, who turns out to be a good guy, tries to get into the Gryffindor common room and the fat lady will not let him. And what does he do? He uses his claws, because he can turn into a black dog, and he scratches the painting, leaving the fat lady with her dress in tatters. And that is kind of the comic relief of the situation. The fact that she's hiding in another painting and being dramatic is the comic relief of the situation. And it was one of the good guys that did that to the fat lady. It was one of the good guys that scratched her and made her dress ripped in tatters. Sticking with the theme of fat phobia, our number 88 out of the top 100 characters, number 26 out of the top 28 female characters is Marge Dursley, Harry Potter's aunt through his uncle Vernon Dursley. She is Vernon Dursley's sister. She is described as having a large, beefy, purple face and a mustache, though it wasn't as bushy as Vernon Dursley. So this character, who was written to be hated, is both fat and manly. 
cool. Marge is a widow and she breeds bulldogs and her fatness is the joke. She was talking some smack about Harry Potter. So what does he do? He drops a dessert on her head and then he blows her up with air. Like Violet Beauregard, she just keeps puffing up, puffing up, and then she floats away. And that's fine because she's a muggle and she's fat. So she deserves it. Coming in at number 83 out of the top 100 Harry Potter characters and number 25 out of the top 28 female Harry Potter characters, we have Bathilda Bagshot, who is the author of A History of Magic. But we don't get to interact with author Bathilda Bagshot. We get to interact with her corpse. Real representation for all the dead girls out there. Bathilda Bagshot's corpse was reanimated by Voldemort and he hid his snake Nagini in her corpse to trap and ambush Harry Potter. So I'm not quite sure if we can call Bathilda Bagshot a female character because she is just a vessel and she has no lines as a human woman and she is a corpse, but she's number 83. So... Coming in at number 80 out of the top 100 characters and number 24 out of the top 28 female characters, we have Narcissa Malfoy, Draco Malfoy's mother. She is described as being tall, slim, pale, and nice looking with long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a cold voice. Narcissa Malfoy is meant to illustrate that a mother's love trumps all. There are multiple mothers that are meant to illustrate that point in Harry Potter, and Narcissa Malfoy is just one of them. In the sixth Harry Potter book, Voldemort tasks Draco Malfoy with killing Dumbledore, which he knows is not achievable for Draco Malfoy. And Narcissa, out of love and concern for her son, makes the unbreakable vow with Snape that Snape will protect her son in his mission to kill Dumbledore and help her son in his mission to kill Dumbledore and that if her son fails to kill Dumbledore, he'll kill Dumbledore. And this is supposed to be a redemptive moment for Narcissa because she's evil, but look, she cares about her son. She's just doing this for her son. And also a redemptive moment for Draco because yeah, he's evil, but he's got a mom. He's somebody's son. But I don't think that that moment feels redemptive at all. Because she's willing to let the whole world burn. She's willing to kill a wizard that is supposed to be this beacon of good. Have that wizard killed by her son or on her son's behalf. As long as her son is safe. Moving on to number 78 in the top 100 characters and number 24 in the top 28 female characters, Pomona Sprout, also known as Professor Sprout. She is described as a squat witch with short curly gray hair and a kind and jolly demeanor. If you're chubby, you're kind and jolly. If you're fat, you're evil. Professor Sprout is a shallow non-character. She might as well just be an illustration on the page. She is just a vessel for knowledge about magical plants. She only serves to teach Harry Potter the things about magical plants that he needs to know for that plot line in that book. But she has no other function. She doesn't have opinions. She doesn't have agency. She's just essentially a human garden gnome. Moving on to number 71 in the top 100 characters in Harry Potter and number 23 in the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter, we have Olymp Maxine. She is the headmaster of Bo Batten's Academy, which is the school that Fleur de la Cour in the Triwizard Tournament went to. She is a half giant and she is described as olive skinned, beak-like nose, extremely tall, large black liquid looking eyes, and brown hair. Something that jumped out at me about the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter is that 
the vast majority of them are explicitly described as having white skin, light skin, or pale skin. Madame Maxine is one of the only characters that is described as having anything other than white skin, and she is described as having olive skin and black liquid-looking eyes and brown hair. She is also a half-giantess, but she claims that she is just big-boned because she is ashamed of her half-giantess heritage. One wonders if J.K. Rowling was trying to do some kind of analogy for being biracial because Madame Maxine is olive-skinned and that is a choice for J.K. Rowling. She doesn't just casually make people olive-skinned. But I also think it's notable that Madame Maxine is not supposed to be pretty. She's this giantess, she's gangly, she's got her beak nose. We're not supposed to think she's pretty and she's also not pale. Things to note. Next, we have number 70 out of the top 100 Harry Potter characters and number 22 out of the top 28 female characters. She's a Gryffindor. She is a Quidditch player. She's Katie Bell. Katie Bell is described as having blonde hair, brown eyes, and light skin. As for her personality, we don't know much because her main purpose in the Harry Potter books is for Harry Potter's character development. In the sixth Harry Potter book, she accidentally touches a cursed necklace that was intended for Harry Potter, and she becomes possessed and is floating and shrieking and screaming. And like Bathilda Bagshot, she is just a vessel for magic here, having no agency and not being able to help herself at all. Harry Potter gets to act fast and also gets to feel guilty about how being the chosen one and being targeted by Voldemort has led to his friend, his dear, dear friend, Katie Bell, who he barely ever talks about, getting possessed. That's hard for Harry knowing that his friend is possessed. Next, number 68 in the top 100 characters in Harry Potter and number 21 in the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter, we have Moaning Myrtle. And boy, is she a doozy. Moaning Myrtle is a ghost that spends most of her time crying in the bathroom, and she spent most of her time while she was alive crying in the bathroom because she was viciously bullied by her peers. She was described as being a squat student with pimples and thick glasses. She had brown hair and eyes and light skin. Moaning Myrtle is primarily in the second book, and the plot of the second book is that the heir of Slytherin is at large once again in the castle and has released Slytherin's monster in the castle and that monster is targeting muggle-born students and petrifying them and everyone is worried that next Slytherin's monster is going to kill a muggle-born student. Let's take a moment to appreciate the fact that the school stays open during this. The students are not sent home because there's a murderous monster on the loose within the castle specifically targeting students with muggle-born parents. No, nobody would be sent home for something so silly and trivial such as that. Harry and Ron spend a lot of the second book in Moaning Myrtle's bathroom trying to figure out what the monster of Slytherin is. And they think that Moaning Myrtle is generally annoying and a burden, but eventually they realize that she died in a bathroom and she might have some answers that they're looking for. It turns out that Moaning Myrtle was killed by Slytherin's monster when Slytherin's monster was first released in the school in the year 1943. A lot of people think that Death Eaters are an allegory, an analogy for Nazis. It seems reasonable that J.K. Rowling was trying to do something with the fact that Moaning Myrtle was killed in 1943 by this fanatic about pure blood status because she was muggle-born. But what does it say about J.K. Rowling and what she thinks of all this that we're meant to think that this victim 
is annoying and insufferable. We are not meant to like Moaning Myrtle. We are not meant to feel bad for Moaning Myrtle, even after we learn the truth of how she died. In fact, she continues to be annoying and a creep throughout the rest of the series. In the fourth Harry Potter book, she goes to a bathroom that Harry's in, taking a bubble bath with a clue from the Triwizard Tournament that he has to submerge underwater to hear, and she's commenting about the bubbles and what she can and cannot see see. Why? Why aren't we meant to have any sympathy for a victim of the heir of Slytherin? I think I got off on my numbers at some point, but we are on number 64 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, number 19 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter, Lily Potter the mother who died. Lily is described as having thick, dark red hair that falls to her shoulders, light skin, and almond-shaped bright green eyes. Lily Potter famously sacrificed herself to save her son and put herself in between Voldemort and her infant baby Harry, and her love turned Voldemort into this weird baby thing for the next 11 years or so. Never mind the fact that James Potter also died to save Harry, everyone is 1000% convinced that it is Lily's love that actually did the trick because there's nothing purer than a mother's love. Definitely not a father's love. What do we know about Lily besides the fact that she sacrificed herself for Harry? We know about her green eyes because every time that Harry interacts with someone, they have to remind him that he's got his mother's eyes. She is objectified even in death. Everybody just remembers her for, for her eyes. Meanwhile, Harry's got his father's Quidditch talent and his father's bravery and his father's tendency to get in trouble, but he's got his mother's eyes. We also know that Snape had a crush on Lily, and that's supposed to be somehow redemptive for his character. We're supposed to think that he is not so bad of a person because he felt guilty after he realized that he had sent Voldemort to Harry Potter's house, not because he sent Voldemort to kill a baby, but because Lily was at Harry Potter's house. And the only people that matter in terms of whether or not they live or die are the people that you have a crush on. Lily was genuinely kind to Snape in school, and so, because women weren't kind to him often, people weren't kind to him often, he was bullied, Snape got this big old crush on Lily, and he hated her boyfriend, James, because James didn't deserve her. Only Snape deserved Lily. He believed in the philosophy of pure blood superiority, but was willing to make an exception for muggle-born Lily Potter. He was not a good guy. He was just an incel. I don't think that him still being in love with a woman that was never available to him is redemptive at all. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. For me, for you, it's probably the same dawn, same day. Regardless, we are on number 18 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 63 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter. It is Parvati Patel. Parvati Patel is a student and a Gryffindor and a twin, and her twin is also in Gryffindor. They are described as having long black hair, though Parvati wears her hair in a plate, which is British for braid. Parvati was Harry Potter's date to the Yule Ball, and Padma was Ron's date to the Yule Ball, which occurred during the fourth book during the Triwizard Tournament. But neither of these ladies were Harry or Ron's first choice. No, Harry wanted to go to the ball with Cho Chang, but she was dating Cedric Diggory, which was actually a hardship for Harry. And then Ron, of course, wanted to go with the love of his life, Hermione, but he didn't ask her in time and she went with Victor Crumb. So they had to go with the Patel sisters. 
Harry and Ron just needed somebody to take to the ball, and Parvati and Padma were somebody, but it didn't matter to Harry and Ron who they were, so why would it matter to us, the reader, who they were? They were just stepping stones along Harry and Ron's journey to end up with the white girls that they eventually end up with. Number 17, out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter, and number 62, out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, it's Angelina Johnson. Angelina Johnson is a Gryffindor and a Quidditch player. She is described as being a tall black girl with long black hair, which she wears in plates, and she has brown eyes. She is the only black woman in the entirety of the Harry Potter series. There are only three black students at Hogwarts during the Harry Potter series. There's Dean Thomas, who plays Quidditch, Angelina Johnson, who plays Quidditch, and Lee Jordan, who is the Quidditch announcer. It is a choice to only have three black students at Hogwarts and to have each of those students involved in sports. We don't really know Angelina Johnson because Harry doesn't know Angelina Johnson, despite being on a Quidditch team with her for years. There are three female chasers on the Gryffindor Quidditch team, and they're often referred to one right after the other in list format, Katie Bell, Angelina Johnson, and Alicia Spinnett. Alicia Spinnett did not make it to our top 100 because she only plays Quidditch and she doesn't have a secondary storyline. Katie Bell made it to our top 100 because she got cursed and then saved. And then Angelina Johnson's in our top 100 because she ends up marrying George Weasley. Angelina Johnson and George Weasley end up having two children, which are referred to in the epilogue. I don't believe we actually meet them, but they are referred to, and those children are the only biracial characters in the entirety of the Harry Potter canon. One might think that Angelina Johnson and George Weasley is a step towards inclusivity for J.K. Rowling, but the problem is that Angelina Johnson could be anybody. You could have just as easily replaced Angelina Johnson with Alicia Spinnett as George's love interest, and it would not have changed the story at all. There are only three non-white women in the top 100 characters in Harry Potter. Parvati Patel, Cho Chang, and Angelina Johnson. And all three of those women are a love interest to somebody at some point. And I think J.K. Rowling makes them love interest because it makes it seem like they have a bigger role in the story than they actually have and more fleshed out characters than they actually have. But in reality, any of those characters could be replaced by any of the other female characters in the book. They don't have anything specific about them that makes them the love interests and they're just flat, hollow characters. Number 16 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 58 in the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, it's Lavender Brown. Lavender Brown is described as having pale skin, deep blue eyes, and long honey blonde curls. She is Ron's annoying and obsessive girlfriend in the sixth Harry Potter book. Now, Lavender Brown was always described as being a white girl in the books, but it seems that the production of the Harry Potter films might have been trying to add a little bit more diversity wherever they could, and Lavender Brown was cast as a black girl for the first several films. However, once it came around to the sixth movie and Lavender Brown was a major character and a love interest, she became white once again. At no point in the sixth book or movie are we supposed to want Lavender Brown and Ron to work out, we are supposed to want Ron to end up with Hermione the entire time. And Lavender Brown is just there to show Ron how wrong this type of girl is for him and how right Hermione is for him. Lavender Brown is girly and romantic and she wants romantic gestures and she wants to go on dates and all of this is portrayed as being ridiculous. How dare a woman have wants in her relationship? 
How dare a woman ask for a man to change anything about his lifestyle or what he would usually do in order to make her happy? Hermione would never ask Ron to go on a date. She would just chill. She would just hang out with them. She would have a butterbeer and kick back and relax with the boys. She would never ask Ron to make romantic gestures because she understands Ron. And she knows that that's not what he likes. So why would she ever ask him to do it? Next, we have number 15 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 55 in the top 100 characters in Harry Potter. It is the matron or school nurse, Madame Pomfrey. Madame Pomfrey is described as having light skin and gray hair, and she's just a caregiver. That's her whole thing. Her whole thing is that she takes care of people. There are no character traits that she has apart from being a caregiver and apart from being motherly. She is stern at times, and that can be annoying to Harry and his friends when they want to talk loudly in the hospital wing and she tells them to be quiet. She is talked about like a roadblock for Harry, Ron, and Hermione's extravagant and dangerous plans. And all she's ever done is dedicate her entire life to taking care of the students at Hogwarts. She's healed Harry Potter more times than he could count on his hands. And yet, where's the respect? Number 14 out of the top. 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 53 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, we have Winky the house elf. Winky is described as being considerably smaller than humans. She has bat-like ears, a tomato-sized nose, and huge brown eyes, and her voice was even higher than Dobby's. Winky only appears in the books, and I can only imagine it's because the producers of the Harry Potter films realized how much her story sucks. Winky is the house elf of Barty Crouch Sr., a Ministry for Magic employee, and she accompanied him to the Quidditch World Cup in the fourth Harry Potter book. After the game of the Quidditch World Cup ended, everyone was milling about, finding their tents, when somebody cast the Dark Mark. The Dark Mark is a rallying point symbol that floats in the sky and tells all of the Death Eaters, the bad guys, that it's time to be bad. Winky found the wand that cast the dark mark and she was holding it when she was ambushed by some Ministry for Magic officials who started accusing her of casting the dark mark. In the world of Harry Potter, it is illegal for house elves to own or use wands, so Winky was in all sorts of trouble. Though they eventually decided that Winky definitely did not cast the dark mark, Barty Crouch Sr. dismisses Winky, frees her by giving her clothes to avoid any liability of having a house elf that held a wand at one point. And Winky hates her freedom. Nothing could have been more devastating to Winky than being freed. She is so ashamed that she let Barty Crouch Sr. down, and she is so ashamed that she was dismissed. There's no greater shame for a house elf. She is given a job at Hogwarts where she works in the kitchens, and she's paid a salary, and that salary sends her into a tailspin because it's so offensive to be paid for her work work. She is entirely depressed. She's drinking. She's getting drunk regularly and Dobby, her friend, is concerned about her and she regularly hurts herself because she's so ashamed. She bangs her head against the wall. She smashes her ears with pots. Hermione in the books, not in the movies, is concerned about house elves and their rights and starts an organization called SPEW, the Society for the Protection of Elfish Welfare. And that is categorized as being well-intentioned, but ultimately entirely misguided because house elves, by their very nature, love to be slaves.
So Hermione is actually insulting them by suggesting that they might want their freedom. And Winky is the character that is supposed to teach Hermione how off base she was about house elves. I think it's a huge red flag that the house elves exist in Harry Potter at all, that J.K. Rowling wrote a species that loves being enslaved. She wrote that species into her books. And I think that the producers of the movies didn't want to touch all these storylines with the house elves because they realize how freaking weird they are. Number 13 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 49 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, it's Rita Skeeter. Rita Skeeter is a gossip columnist for The Daily Prophet, the news organization that seems to entirely control the flow of news in the wizarding world. She is described as having blonde hair and elaborate curls, a heavy jaw, three gold teeth, and thick fingers with crimson nails. Rita Skeeter is slimy and gross, and she has zero journalistic integrity. She literally turns into a beetle to eavesdrop on conversations and get the latest scoop. She's quoted as saying that the truth doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what people want to read. She really sticks to that philosophy by printing so many slanderous lies about Harry Potter. I think there's both misogyny and classism in this character. There's only one journalist in the entire series, and she's a woman, and she loves to gossip, and she's essentially TMZ. She's the paparazzi. She's a parasite. She's also described as having a heavy jaw and thick fingers, and J.K. Rowling has a tendency to give the women we're not supposed to like traditionally masculine features. She also has three gold teeth, which I think is J.K. Rowling telling us, look, she didn't even brush her teeth right. She lost three of her teeth because she wasn't even brushing good enough. Also, her fingernails, her crimson fingernails. We don't hear anything about anybody else's fingernails in the series, but every time Rita Skeeter is on the page, chances are we're hearing about those red nails. And red nails can symbolize women of the night. I think the red nails are J.K. Rowling's way of calling Rita Skeeter tawdry without saying the word tawdry. Because I think that tawdry is more of a southern word and wouldn't fit so well in this British world. Number 12 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 44 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, it's Cho Chang. Cho Chang is described as being a very pretty girl with long, shiny, dark hair, a freckled nose, and she is a head shorter than Harry Potter. How perfect. She can just rest her little head right here on his chest because she's just the perfect little height for him. Cho Chang dated Cedric Diggory in the fourth Harry Potter book. And of course, Cedric Diggory is killed by Voldemort and Peter Pettigrew. So Cho Chang is grieving in the fifth book. But her grief certainly does not stop Harry Potter from making a move. In fact, when they kiss, Cho is crying because she's thinking about her dead boyfriend. Cho Chang's emotions and her grief are annoying for Harry. He spends a lot of the fifth book trying to figure out what this girl wants. Does she want to date him? Is she still in love with Cedric? Like, why isn't she over Cedric yet? It's been six months, Cho Chang. Are you going to be crying about your dead boyfriend forever? Cho Chang joins Dumbledore's army, which is a secret organization that learns defense against the dark arts from Harry Potter in the Room of Requirement during the fifth book. But because she's a woman and because she's needy, she couldn't just go to these Dumbledore's army meetings without a friend. 
So she pressures her friend Marietta Edgecombe to also join Dumbledore's army. Marietta Edgecombe never wanted to join Dumbledore's army. She was just doing it for Cho. The entire time it made her uncomfortable because her mom works for the Ministry for Magic and she was worried about her mom losing her job. And of course, Dolores Umbridge uses that against her to get her to tell on Dumbledore's army and she does spill the beans, getting them all in trouble. When Marietta Edgecombe rats out Dumbledore's army because she is afraid for her mother's career, they are sure to let her know just how they feel about her disloyalty. And they jinx her with a curse that makes it so that the word sneak is spelled out in boils across her face. Marietta Edgecombe's mistake is the end of Harry and Cho's relationship. He very much blames Cho for allowing this person into their inner circle. Harry values loyalty above all else, and Cho has proven that she has faulty judgment. If she is bringing these silly girls that care about their mom's careers into Dumbledore's army, that's a reflection on her poor judgment. Essentially, the conclusion with Cho Chang's character is that girls are confusing and they can't be trusted, especially when they're pretty. On to number 11. Out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 43 in the top 100 characters, it is Bellatrix Lestrange. Bellatrix Lestrange is described as having wild looks, dark curly hair, black eyes, and white skin, and she is the Dark Lord's most loyal servant. Bellatrix Lestrange is also Sirius Black's cousin, and her character shows how evil Sirius Black could have been had he chosen to go down that route, because he was raised in a similar pure blood loving environment as Bellatrix, but he chose a different path because he is not an evil sadist like her. Bellatrix will follow Voldemort to the ends of the earth because she's delusional and she's in love with him and she sees herself as his dark princess of sorts, but he knows she exists. He just doesn't care. He thinks that she's generally annoying and he doesn't feel any love for any human being on earth. So those feelings are entirely unrequited and she is just the most passionate member of his cult. Bellatrix is a caricature of a wicked witch and a puppet at the same time. She is used by Voldemort as a vessel for his evil because she's too delusional to realize that she's being used because women simply aren't blessed with the same logic as men like Sirius Black are blessed with. Number 10 out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 40 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, we have Nymphadora Tonks. Tonks is an auror, which means that she fights dark wizards on behalf of the government. She is also a member of the Order of the Phoenix, which is an underground organization that resists Voldemort's control and power. She is described as being pale with a heart-shaped face, dark eyes, and short, spiky violet hair. Tonks can also shapeshift. She can change the color of her hair, the shape of her nose, her entire appearance on a whim, and that's cool. That's not something that every character in Harry Potter can do, and it's cool that J.K. Rowling gave that unique ability to a female character. Tonks is really the only female character that we see that is not a member of the school staff on the ground doing dangerous stuff to fight against Voldemort. Yes, Molly Weasley is also a part of the Order of the Phoenix, but she's not doing the type of dangerous missions that Tonks is doing because she's a mother. 
And she can't put herself at risk like that because what would her kids do without her? There are no queer characters in Harry Potter. Yes, J.K. Rowling said that Dumbledore is gay after the fact, but she also said that Hermione is black after the fact, even though Hermione is described as being, being very pale and very white multiple times. But a lot of Harry Potter fans, when they met Nymphadora Tonks, thought, we are finally going to get some queer representation, or at the very least, a character that is not explicitly straight. But Tonks is explicitly straight, and she marries Remus Lupin, an older man, and she has a child, and she dies for the greater good and for that child, like every good mother does. There's no better mother than a dead mother. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being a mother and there's nothing wrong with being straight and there's nothing wrong with marrying Remus Lupin. I think the reason Tonks disappointed so many people is because they thought maybe just this one time we could have a character that did something different. Number nine out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 37 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, we have Fleur de la Queue. Fleur de la Queue is a student at Beau Batten's Academy and she is the only witch that competes in the Triwizard Tournament in the fourth book. She is described as being a stunningly beautiful witch with wavy silver blonde hair that seems to float behind her as she walks. She is also half Vila or part Vila and Vila is a mythical creature who is described as being semi-human magical beings, beautiful women with white gold hair and skin that appears to shine moon bright. When angry, Vila take on a less pleasant appearance, their faces elongate into sharp, cruel, beaked bird heads, and long, scaly wings burst from their shoulders. Because, of course, women lose their beauty when they're angry. There's nothing uglier than anger on a woman. Fleur de la Cure is gorgeous, mysterious, and unknowable. The fact that she speaks French only adds to that fact. She is meant to be an object of desire that men lust after and that women compare themselves to bitterly. Fleur ends up marrying Bill Weasley in the seventh Harry Potter book and Jenny and Hermione mock her endlessly. Instead of being excited about her new sister-in-law, Jenny spends the first section of the seventh book just teasing her and mocking her and making it seem like she's this silly, frou-frou little princess. Even though she competed in the Triwizard Tournament, even though she is a talented witch, Jenny still feels all this jealousness and bitterness and can't be nice to her. She also does the worst in the Triwizard Tournament. She is the only witch out of four competitors, and of course, each of the three wizards do better than her at all of the tasks, including Harry Potter, who is 14 while she's 17 and is not supposed to have the knowledge to really compete in this tournament. It's a choice to make the girl the one that's the worst at the sporting event. I think the way that the other female characters treat Fleur de la Cour is really telling for J.K. Rowling's mindset about women in that she thinks we're just so jealous of each other all the time that women, when they see a beautiful women, woman, are not going to be supportive. They are not going to want to be friends with that girl. They are going to be jealous and they're going to be hateful because women just go around wishing we had other people's bodies and other people's faces, and we can't be happy with who we are. Number eight out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter, and number 36 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, we have Sybil Trelawney. 
Sybil Trelawney is the divination professor at Hogwarts. She is described as wearing very large glasses that make her eyes appear several times larger than they actually are. She has a soft and misty voice, dark green eyes, and light skin. Divination is a specifically feminine branch of magic, and it is a branch of magic that is mocked by the wizarding community at large. Divination and the gift of sight and being a seer passes down the maternal line. So Sybil Trelawney got her gift of sight from her great, great, great grandmother or something like that. Trelawney was actually the witch that delivered the prophecy that Harry Potter, or Neville Longbottom, was the chosen one. But it wasn't really her delivering the prophecy, because when a prophecy is delivered, it just comes out of that person as an entirely different voice. Trelawney wasn't even aware of the fact that she gave this prophecy after the fact, because it was as if she wasn't even in the room. So yet again, we have a female character who is just a vessel and has no agency. Sybil's character could have been replaced by a beanie baby and it really wouldn't have made a difference. The prophecy could have come out of an inanimate object. She did not need to be there because it is not Sybil Trelawney who moves the plot. It's the prophecy that moves the plot and the prophecy just happens to come out of Sybil Trelawney. Number seven. Out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 29 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter, we have Petunia Dursley. Petunia Dursley is a muggle and she is Harry Potter's aunt, his mother's sister. She is a stay-at-home mom and she is described as being a thin blonde woman with a long neck, large pale eyes, and horse-like teeth. Petunia Dursley is such an unrealistic character to me. She is Lily Potter's sister, and we're supposed to believe that she was so jealous of the fact that Lily Potter had magic, and she didn't, that she dedicated her life to being anti-magic and marrying this anti-magic man. And she harbored so much resentment towards this sister that even when she died, she continued to be cruel to his orphaned son. I have a sister, and this does not feel remotely close to sisterhood for me. J.K. Rowling has a sister. Is this what sisterhood was like for her? If I was J.K. Rowling's sister, I would be offended by the Petunia Dursley storyline, because is that what J.K. Rowling thinks of her sister? That her writing talent makes her sister so jealous she can hardly stand it? There are no storylines about the power of sisterly love in Harry Potter, but there's this storyline about the power of sisterly jealousy, because this is what women are to JK Rowling. We're just so jealous of each other that we would let our bitterness make us reject our one and only sister and never talk to her for the rest of our lives. Not because she did anything specific to us, just because she has skills that we don't have. Number six out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 27 out of the top 100 characters, we have Luna Lovegood. Luna Lovegood is a student in the year below Harry in school. She is a Ravenclaw and she is described as having straggly waist length, dirty blonde hair and a dazed dreamy look on her face with very pale eyebrows and protuberant eyes and pale skin. All the female characters that we are supposed to like are not like the other girls in some way or another or they're the perfect mother. And of course Luna Lovegood is not a mother, she's a manic pixie dream girl. Luna is the weird girl, she's an outcast, she doesn't fit in and she doesn't say the right things. And part of why Harry Potter takes her under his wing is because he cares about the outcasts, he cares about the weirdos in ways that everyone else doesn't. Don't get me wrong, I also like the weirdos and the outcasts, and I really liked Luna Lovegood's character growing up, but I would have liked her more if she actually impacted the plot. 
you could entirely delete Luna Lovegood's character from the Harry Potter series and the plot would be largely unaffected. I wish that the female characters got to make decisions that moved things forward, but that was just so rarely the case in these books. Number five out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 18 out of the top 100, we have Dolores Umbridge. Dolores Umbridge is described as being a short squat woman resembling a large pale toad. In the fifth Harry Potter book, the Minister for Magic gives her the position of Professor of Defense Against the Dark Arts at Hogwarts and later Headmaster of Hogwarts. Usually, she is the Senior Undersecretary to the Minister for Magic and the Head of Muggle Born Registration Committee. There is no villain apart from Dumbledore that we're supposed to hate more than Dolores Umbridge. She has a sickly sweet voice and she wears pink every single day. Her office is covered in pink and kittens and tea and frilly things and she's a sadist who enjoys torturing children. Her big thing is denying the realities of their world and denying that Voldemort is back. And when Harry insists that Voldemort is back, she has him write, I must not tell lies with his own blood on the back of his hand. And at the end of the fifth book, Dolores Umbridge is carried into the woods by a group of centaurs who we only can assume plan to assault her. And the students are cheering. And we, the reader, are supposed to be cheering because Dolores Umbridge got what was coming to her. Assault. Through Dolores Umbridge's character, J.K. Rowling associates traditionally feminine traits and interests with being evil. Who else might be interested in pink and kittens other than Dolores Umbridge? some of the adolescent girls who are reading Harry Potter. It's not inherently bad that a feminine character is evil in Harry Potter, but there are no positive representations for femininity in Harry Potter. If we're supposed to like that character, they are going to reject femininity in some way. They are going to be not like the other girls in some way. Every character that has these explicit feminine traits is somewhere between annoying and evil. We don't get any backstory that explains why Umbridge is the way she is, the same way we didn't get a backstory really to explain why Bellatrix was the way she was. With Tom Riddle, with Voldemort, we get a backstory. He was an orphan. He had a tough childhood that we can empathize and sympathize with, even if we don't approve of who he has become. But with these female villains, we do not get a backstory that humanizes them in any way. They're just pure evil. Number four, out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 17 out of the top 100 characters we have, Molly Weasley. Molly Weasley is described as having bright brown eyes, red hair, and fair skin, and being slightly plump and kindly looking. She is the mother of the Weasley children and the devoted loving wife of Arthur Weasley. Molly Weasley is presented as the ideal wife and mother. She has seven children, so she spent a good portion of her life barefoot and pregnant. She's a stay-at-home mom, even after all of her children are either away working or at boarding school, and she supports her husband husband Arthur unequivocally. He does a job for the Ministry for Magic working on his passion which is muggle artifacts and that job doesn't pay much at all and the Weasleys are barely getting by but still Molly supports his choices unquestioningly. Ron's childhood serves as a foil to Harry's childhood in many ways and Molly Weasley is a huge part of that. Ron was raised surrounded by love, intense and at times oppressive love, but always love. And Harry was raised in this cold, sterile environment. But Harry was rich and never had to worry about money. And part of the cost to growing up surrounded by love, J.K. Rowling seems to imply, is being poor. 
Molly Weasley's whole character is how good of a mother she is and how much she cares about her kids. Even though sometimes her kids feel like she's nagging them, they understand why she is the way she is and ultimately they would not trade her for the world. But who is Molly Weasley outside of her children? We don't know. We know that Arthur Weasley has this fascination with muggle artifacts, but we don't know anything about Molly Weasley's interests, or if she has interests at all outside of her children. She's pure mother at every point. In the seventh book, she actually kills Bellatrix Lestrange when Bellatrix Lestrange is attempting to kill her daughter, Jenny. And she steps in front of Jenny and says, not my daughter, bitch. Because even when she's being a bad ass, she has to be a bad ass mother, not just a bad ass woman or person. The moment where Molly kills Bellatrix is another one of those a mother's love trumps all moments in the Harry Potter series. Molly Weasley just uses her magic mainly for domestic tasks, for cleaning and cooking and organizing, but she's able to defeat this notorious dark witch because she's overwhelmed with a mother's love. We are on number three of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 16 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter. It's Minerva McGonagall. Minerva McGonagall is described as a tall, stern looking witch with black hair usually drawn into a tight bun, thin lips, and light skin. She is the professor of transfiguration at Hogwarts and she is the head of Gryffindor House. She is also able to turn into a cat and we see her in her cat form at numerous points throughout the series. Minerva McGonagall is the stern parent to Dumbledore's fun parent. She is always the one who has to make the tough choices and tell the kids that they actually can't go fight dark wizards in the middle of the night and that they have to go back to their common room and that makes her kind of a buzzkill. She's presumably single, we never see her have a romantic interest and she turns into a cat. I think that JK Rowling has something against cat ladies because she frequently makes allusions to cat ladies. Dolores Umbridge is also presumably single and she loves cats and has cats all over the place. Even though Minerva McGonagall in general is always looking out for the best interest of her students, even though she puts her foot down only at times where somebody really needed to put their foot down and look out for the kids, she still doesn't get to be a fun or well-liked character. She is a humorless character. She is stern and cold, even though she's one of the good guys. We are on to number two out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and number 15 out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter. It's Jenny Weasley. Jenny Weasley is the youngest of the Weasley siblings and the only girl. She is a student and a Gryffindor and she is in the year below Harry in school. She is described as having red hair and a freckled complexion. She is of petite stature and has bright brown eyes like her mother. When she blushes, her face turns a shade of red that matches her hair and she has light skin. From the first time we meet Jenny Weasley, she was written to be the ideal girlfriend for Harry Potter and the end game relationship for Harry Potter. From the very first moment she saw Harry on platform nine and three quarters when he was off to start his first year and she was still too young to go to Hogwarts, she had a crush. Jenny's infatuation with Harry is at full strength as she starts her first year at Hogwarts, and he just barely notices it. It's a blip on Harry's radar because, of course, at that point, he's not thinking about girls. But her crush actually gets her and the rest of Hogwarts in trouble. 
She found a diary and she started writing in that diary, including writing about her crush on Harry Potter. And it's that vulnerability and openness that made her a perfect target for Voldemort. Because it wasn't just any diary that she was writing in, it was Tom Riddle, aka Voldemort's diary. And her vulnerability, her sensitivity, her openness with her emotions made it possible for Voldemort to completely control her and make his way into Hogwarts to release the monster of Slytherin. So for much of the second book, she is just one of Voldemort's puppets. She is a vessel being used by somebody else, like so many other female characters. And then she's the perfect victim. Lying on the floor of the sewer system beneath Hogwarts, completely unconscious and helpless, Jenny just waits for Harry and Ron to come and save her. And of course, they save her. They get her out of the sticky situation that she created through her own feminine naivete. And they are the knights in shining armor at the end of the day. Jenny certainly learned her lesson from that whole ordeal, and she keeps her emotions much more in check for the rest of the series. She's a tomboy, she wears hamney downs, and she plays Quidditch. She can hang with the boys, she can chill with the boys, and she has put the sentimentality of her younger years behind her. When it's convenient for Harry, he lifts his head to see the beautiful girl that's been standing in front of him this entire time. And she's perfect. She's the perfect girlfriend, in part because she knows her place in Harry's life. She doesn't ask Harry to change a thing about the way he operates. She doesn't ask him for dates or alone time or romantic gestures because a cool girl would not ask for those things, want those things, or need those things. And she knows that Harry's friends come before her. She knows that Harry is not going to consult her on one of his many dangerous missions. She knows that his friends are there for that purpose and she never tries to get him to redirect that energy and include her in his scheming. It's finally time for the number one female character out of the top 28 female characters in Harry Potter and the number three character out of the top 100 characters in Harry Potter. I'm talking, of course, about Hermione Granger. Hermione is a student and a Gryffindor in Harry Potter's year. She is described as being very pale, very white, and having bushy brown hair, brown eyes, and large front teeth. She is also described as an insufferable know-it-all. The first time we meet Hermione Granger on the train, on the way to Hogwarts, she fixes Harry's glasses, which is just the first of many, many times that she will act as a mother figure for Harry or Ron. At first, Ron can't stand Hermione. He thinks that she is an insufferable know-it-all, and he gets particularly mad at her when she tries to stop him and Harry from sneaking out so that Harry can duel Draco. Was it the right thing to do for Hermione to try to stop those boys from sneaking out and losing them house points? Yes, it was. But that doesn't stop Ron from resenting Hermione for it. To the point that he's making fun of her to Harry at one point, and she overhears. She runs to the bathroom to go cry her eyes out, and that's when a staggering Professor Quirrell comes in to say that there's a troll in the dungeon. And Ron and Harry realize that Hermione just went to the bathroom in the dungeon. So they rush to go save her. And lo and behold, there is a troll in the very bathroom that she's in. And Harry and Ron have to use their limited magical knowledge to save Hermione from the troll. And then when McGonagall comes and asks them why they were there, Hermione takes the blame and says that it was her. 
who thought that she could take on a troll and rushed to go do that, battle a troll as an 11 year old and Harry and Ron just came to save her. So even though it was Ron and his cruel words that sent her to that dungeon bathroom to be attacked, he gets to have all the credit for saving her and everything is good and she takes the blame. Hermione is also muggle-born. Her parents are dentists, and she's frequently the target of bigotry. And Harry and Ron get to be her knights in shining armor and stand up for her, even though she is fully capable of standing up for herself, and they are just 11-year-old boys like she is an 11-year-old girl. When Draco calls Hermione a mudblood, the slur of the wizarding world, it's Ron who tries to curse him and ends up accidentally cursing himself so that he's throwing up slugs. Harry and Ron get to use Hermione's trauma as a way to show how good of people they are and how they care about muggle-born people without having to be muggle-born themselves. Being muggle-born also means that she is a victim in the second book. She is petrified, aka frozen, by Slytherin's monster when she's trying to research to find out what Slytherin's monster is, and she spends much of the second book unconscious in the hospital wing. She does figure out what the monster is and has that answer clutched in her little fist, and Harry and Ron, when they're visiting her in the hospital wing, find the answer in her fist, but still they get all the glory of defeating the basilisk and her intellectual help comes secondary to that. It's in the second book, I believe, that she starts her organization, Spew, the Society for the Protection of Elfish Welfare. She didn't grow up in the magical world, so she just doesn't get it that house elves want to be enslaved to humans, that that's their natural state of being. So though it's really cute of her to do so, she doesn't understand house elves when she's advocating for their rights. With the whole house elf storyline, it feels like JK Rowling is trying to say that being overly caring and sentimental can sometimes make you blind to the truth of situations. And Hermione, though it's nice that she cares so much about these lesser beings, is blinded by her compassion. I always found this odd when I was reading this series, the very first time that I read through this series when I was a tween. I found this storyline odd because I immediately thought that Hermione was right, that Spew was a good organization to found, and that the rights of house elves were a good thing to advocate for. And I was so confused by the tone in the book and how actually Hermione's advocacy was supposed to be kind of silly and meaningless. I never understood it. And now, seeing who J.K. Rowling is, I understand it a little better. In the third book, Hermione takes more classes than it's physically possible to take. McGonagall gives her a time turner a device that allows her to go back an hour in time and take classes that occur at the same time. So she has this huge course load. McGonagall helps her to achieve this enormous course load and encourages her to work herself to the bone and to take more classes than should be humanly possible. Hermione was already the smartest witch in her year, the smartest person in her year by a mile, but because she's a woman and because she's got this muggle-born status, she's constantly having to be exceptional to be seen as good and she's constantly having to prove herself and McGonagall as this other smart powerful woman seems to fall into the trap of pushing Hermione to 
be exceptional, prove how exceptional she is at all times, rather than treating her like the child that she is. In the seventh book, Hermione completely erases her parents' memory of her to protect them from Voldemort. This is a huge sacrifice that really is not dwelled upon in the book and probably not dwelled upon because we don't know Hermione's parents at all. We have such an intimate look into Ron's background and upbringing and yet the only thing that we know about Harry's other best friend's parents is that they're dentists. Hermione also does Harry and Ron's homework all the time. Harry frequently says that he does not know how he would have made it through school without Hermione Granger because she's always picking up him and Ron's slack. And it's not that they're always going on these missions to defeat bad guys and that's why they didn't get their homework done. They're messing around. They're flying around. They're playing Quidditch. They're goofing off. And she prevents that from ever affecting them. Hermione never gets to be likable in the ways that Harry and Ron are likable. Harry and Ron are just the popular guys at school that everybody wants to be friends with. And Hermione is annoying and shrill and a know-it-all. And she is not fun. She is not funny. She is a stick in the mud despite the fact that she is constantly saving everybody's asses. J.K. Rowling doesn't really like women. She doesn't think that they're as important or interesting as men to the extent that nearly three quarters of the characters in her popular series are men. Of course, J.K. Rowling thinks that she's important and interesting. She just thinks that most women aren't and that her being important and interesting in her eyes is in contrast to the majority of women because she thinks that she's not like the other girls. And she's right. She's not like the other girls. She's bitter and resentful and jealous. And that's not how we are. We're supportive and we love each other and we love our female friends. So yeah, JK Rowling, I guess you're not like the other girls and we would never want to be like you. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it entertaining or educational or whatever else. If you would like more videos in this list format, please let me know because I had a blast making this and researching for this and I feel quite fulfilled now at the end of filming. I hope you guys have a great day. I hope you guys have a great night. I'll see you next time. You've got this.